Uh oh. Oh. Major hit. I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I can. I can talk about it. <laughs>
Um, Black Panther was daunting in the beginning because it, there was such a huge fan base. And I mean, I called my brother, who was a police officer in Springfield, Massachusetts, and all the guys who were in the office at the time got on speakerphone and they were all giving me pointers about the Black Panther. So I went into this knowing I had a huge responsibility and that I had better get it right because there are a lot of people who are going to be watching. You know, it's so funny that um, I, I'm theater trained and in theater you um, usually are working like large scale. You do a big production, a big opera, you have several characterizations to examine, you have several layers, and that, that theater training actually prepared me for large scale uh, movies. When I received, when I got Malcolm X, um, I, it was maybe my third or fourth film ever, and it was a huge film. But because I had already been trained in organizing costumes for, for plays and the layers and, and researching eras, different, different eras, um, I actually had a bit of a roadmap um, with which I used to organize Malcolm X. And um, back then, I was still coming from grassroots filmmaking. So I was in charge. I was in charge of, you know, how many background we saw a day. And I, I was in charge of all the fittings for the day players. You know, I multitasked. I wore many hats. And, I, and I, I'm not so in charge of every department anymore, but that experience taught me how to really organize my uh, thoughts, the art of the film, and how we get to the end result. And so doing a film like Malcolm X, Selma, The Butler, uh, Amistad, leading up to Black Panther, gave me, I feel, a full circle moment. It was less the organization, because I, I'm familiar with the organization. It was more the, how do you create a culture? And our, the, uh, in the past, my other films, creating that culture meant I studied the color palettes of the 60s, or I looked at, you know, the, the silhouettes of the 70s. Um, and this, with Black Panther, I got to create it from, uh, from, from research of ancient tribes around the whole continent of Africa, but also to imagine it. So that's the, the added piece to Black Panther that we were able to use imagination. That makes it kind of the Afro future and the imagination, um, uh, of a culture and my past experiences helped me know how to create it. Marvel, uh, Marvel owns everything, uh, but I keep kept uh, sketches in their prints of the sketches. Um, everything's electronic now, so uh, where throughout my whole career I was able to keep these beautiful original sketches that either I did or illustrators did and they were, you know, hand painted and beautifully done. Now all the illustrators work, are on, all their work is done on computer. So I get like a digital file. It's not as fun as having like the beautiful uh, hand painted illustrations. I miss that. You know, there's some illustrators that still do it. I understand why they don't because they are able to make corrections, go back five steps without starting over again. So, um, and costume wise, I, um, I'm mounting an exhibition of my work. And so I have kept over the years costumes, but Black Panther is an exception because Marvel uses them in their theme parks. There's Black Panther walking around a the theme park right now. Yeah. And there, it looks like- hopefully. It's the real one. I've seen them and I was like, hey, come over here. Let me check that out. <laughs> And I was like, what are you doing in T'Challa's suit? Who are you? <laughs> Jared. Well, go back, Jared. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like it's unbelievable that they use them for fans, for theme parks, because Marvel is Disney. But I feel like the Black Panther costumes really need to be archived 
because it was such a phenomenon. And there's so many films that we have, that are part of the hi black history and the costumes like are gone. You know, you think of, you know, Lena Horne singing in Porgy and Bess. You wish that you somebody had kept that dress somewhere. You know, Hattie McDaniels. I would love to see her uniform from Gone with the Wind. And I, I, I'm about preservation, and that's too a part of the theater training that I had. I hope there's a Black Panther too. I can't see why there wouldn't be. Because the fans just reacted to this one so intensely that people are making up, you know, what next is. They have Wakandan passports. They're trying to get tickets to Wakanda, you know. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> it exists in here. Right. Okay, so we'll switch gears. Um, uh, when I first heard about Taylor Sheridan, I saw Hell or High Water, and I thought the relationships and the writing in that was incredible. I thought that the direction was so brave and uh, unapologetic, and I like films like that. Then I came on to this, and I saw Wind River, and I, I had to stop Taylor and say, you know, I want to know a little bit more about you because what what's what a sense of balance of sensitivity and you know just daring bravery in that film and what a story like different than you normally see and he's the kind of filmmaker that I like to work with that you know really wants you to dig deep really wants you to do something different and so I may not have been initially attracted to Yellowstone from Wind River and seeing all those things that I caught up to but um, you know knowing that he was this great writer and and director is the thing that brought me here. Um, well, uh, I think the biggest difference is truly, it's completely different than a superhero film, but um, the ability to explore culture, the Native American culture, I learned about uh, Montana uh, Native Americans who are Crow. I know that the difference now between the Southwest Native Americans and how they use more silver and turquoise and how, you know, what this region is more inclined to do more beading and handwork in that way. And, you know, we are, we are still examining culture. We are st the cowboy culture is still alive and well. So, you know, there is a similarity in that Black Panther dealt with a lot of, you know, uh, African Americans and the diaspora and their culture. And now here we are in Utah and we're examining the Native American and the, and the American cowboy. The superheroes in Yellowstone, first is Taylor Sheridan. He is the superhero. Um, and actually, you know, when you see him walking around, he acts like a superhero, you know? And um, then I think the other superhero is Kevin Costner. Uh, we know him from, you know, his past films that were amazing. Dances with Wolves, amazing. And so it's nice to see him back in the West in his, I feel like his, his natural environment. And uh, he is truly a superhero. He's more than a movie star. And uh, just talking to him and knowing how much he cares and how it comes out in his acting, I think he's definitely the superhero of the series. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the person who would make me nervous to me, Tom Hardy, for sure. Oh, my God. I've seen so many of his films. I just love his approach to characterization. I think we could work together. Not only that he's this like handsome guy, but he's also really a great actor. So I think Tom Hardy would stop me in my tracks, as well as Idris Elba, and maybe uh, I could think of a few more. 
Okay, I wish I could tell you, you know, that I'm overwhelmed with joy when I sit in the movie theater, especially for the first time seeing something that I've done. But I'm not. I have butterflies. I'm actually kind of dizzy. I'm, I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, what happened to that other shirt that I selected? It's not, we're not going to go on to that scene. Uh, oh, they cut that. Oh, I, I'm just having a range of emotions that you don't want to be me. Uh, it's not until I see the film maybe four times that I say, wow, you know what? The story, the story is really good or the story is really bad and the costumes are really good. You know, I feel like it's, uh, uh, the curse of the person who's too close to creating it. We don't get to experience it the way that a novice would coming into the theater and anticipating this film and going on the ride and the experience because we experienced it in all these segmented ways. Um, for me, it takes a long time. I mean, Ryan Coogler walked up to me at, after we saw the movie at the premiere and he was like, Ruth, what did you think? And I was like, I have to see it again. You know, and I, ha I had to be honest. I said, I'm so focused on all my shit that I can't see the movie. And uh, I, it was the fourth time that I said, wow, you know, there's so much in that film. And I stopped worrying about the things that we made, you know, we sweated over and we presented in front of camera and it didn't make the cut. You kind of get over that. Well, the way that I, I decompress after having uh, gone on a long journey of filmmaking with deadlines and the creative process is so high, the demands on the creativity is so high. Um, uh, I usually, when I get home, I used to rearrange the house. I was like, oh, the den is horrible. Who thought of this? Let's move the chairs around. But now I paint. And paint, I find a, a picture, sometimes it's a fitting photo that I really loved. I have one of Vanessa Redgrave, I have one of Oprah, I have one of Angela Bassett as Tina Turner and Ike Turner. Just a fitting photo where they stood in the right pose, they have the right facial expression, and I take those and I paint them on canvases that are maybe uh, four feet by five feet. I mean, they're, they're huge canvases and it takes me a while to do and map out but that sort of like gradually kind of simmers me down to be normal again uh, let's see oh Sundance, Sundance. yeah yeah so I've been to Sundance. Um, I had two films at Sundance. One was an Austin Kutcher film called Spread, and then the other one was Black Dynamite, and they premiered at uh, Sundance at the same time. So it was kind of really kooky to go from Ashton Kutcher's uh, premiere to Black Dynamite. You know, the Utah Film Studios is a place where you can be creative, it uh, allows you a lot of space to expand on what you need to do. There's, there's room here. It's fresh and new. And, you know, we've been so used to working in these dungeons. Uh, this being a fresh place that's wide open is really kind of a breath of, breath of fresh air for a creative person. And now that space is so comfortable. How often do we get to have our own offices in our space here at Utah Film Studios and also have a bullpen, also have our own kitchen. So the, the space, the way that they are arranged are really compatible for each department to actually flourish and have those moments where they need to close the door and have conversations and then, you know, act, have a bullpen with which to work out of. Yeah. So.